Hey, thanks for having me here in, uh, in Watertown today. Um, so today we have a little bit of a packed agenda because I'm giving not one but two talks because I insisted like, you know, if you're going to have me here, I want to also talk about something technical in addition to something diversity related. And actually, as you'll see, the first talk winds up weaving into the second talk a little bit. This talk is, this first talk is about how do we make sure that people feel welcome at work? How do we eliminate not the obvious things, but instead how do we eliminate the subtle things that make people feel uncomfortable at work. So I want to first lead off by saying I'm going to quote some things that are potentially problematic. Uh, these are things that I want you to not do. Right? I'm talking about these things that you're aware that there are some that, that there are some patterns to avoid. So they're not my views, they're not Google's views, they're not Honeycomb's views, uh, the negative examples that appear in quotes. It's possible, by the way, that you may recognize yourself in some of these examples. If so, right, like this is not a I'm calling you out, you're a bad person. This is instead a, okay, now that we've had this converse conversation, now you can stop and think and say, okay, the next time I do that by accident, I'm going to catch myself, I'm going to apologize, and then, and then accept, and then the person on the other side is going to accept the apology and we'll move, up, we'll move on, right? That will get better through continuous improvement. So, as with many situations, it turns out that having to give a talk about diversity as someone who is from a underrepresented background winds up sometimes being a blessing and sometimes a curse, right? I have a lot of experience to bring to the table, but also I'm glad that I had the opportunity to present the second kind of more technical talk because I want people to also understand that I do talk about tech as well every now and then. So let's start off with a little bit of theoretical background. Um, as well as a little bit of practical background about my experience because you kind of have to think about what background does someone come from in evaluating kind of what experiences do they have, how are they different from yours, how are they the same, same as yours, right? Uh, for instance, how many of you in this room went to college? How many of you graduated college? How many of you graduated college the first time around? See, interesting, right? Things that are things that are properties of of, of how we uh, of where we come from, or let's talk about how many people grew up in a in a household with two income earning parents. How many people grew up in a household with one income earning parent, right? All sorts of interesting differences that may impact kind of how you look at careers, how you look at family structures, how you look at inclusion issues. Um, so there are some things I can speak to, some things I can't speak to. Um, I can't speak to the experience of people who are first generation immigrants, for instance, because I'm second generation. Um, I can't speak to the experiences of people who are neither male nor female because I identify as female. Um, right? So, but I'm going to try to provide a overview of some of the broader issues that people might encounter in your workplace. So let's first start off by getting ourselves on the same page about why it matters to make sure that people feel included, right? I kind of can't talk about how do you make people feel more included without talking about the rationale, why are we doing this? So diversity and inclusion matter because it helps ensure that people have equality of opportunity, and it also ensures that your business can succeed because it actually represents diverse perspectives. But kind of at the end of the day, it really, really sucks as human beings to alienate, your, to alienate your coworkers or alienate your customers. Or Athena Health's case, right, like your customers are the medical system, but also your customers are individual patients, right? So for instance, I'm going to talk about a example right now, um, which is not in the slide decks, right? What is your gender option, right? What are your gender options in your product? Do you allow people to identify both a, what would you like to pass on to the insurance provider as the patient's gender versus what is being recorded in someone's chart for what pronouns a doctor is supposed to refer to someone with, right? Those are important things that do impact whether trans people feel safe using the medical system. So let's talk about um, simple things, uh, gender inequality. So I noticed that in this room, there is a fairly diverse uh, range of genders. That's really awesome. Um, Unfortunately, that isn't necessarily broadly the case, right? Like in the United States, uh, there is a gap in terms of the amount of money that women make. There's a gap in the number of women who are in the workplace. There is no federal level protection 
for equal an equal rights amendment, right? There are specific protections around sex discrimination, but not around kind of the broader issue. And there is a significant issue with domestic violence. There are so many different things that cause people to have different experiences when they come to work. And specifically in tech, these issues get more magnified because women aren't 50% of the population. Women wind up being somewhere around 20% of the population in, in a more progressive workplace, and often the number is far smaller than that. And it's really pronounced in startup land, right? In situations where people are taking bets on, am I going to start this business and potentially have it fail? And the people choosing which bets that they make, only 12% of Y Combinator uh, founders are women. And that's 12% of the founders, not 12% of the teams that are selected that contain at least one woman. So this is kind of a problem with regard to who has the opportunity to make the salaries that we make as tech employees. And I also want to talk about race. But before I talk about race, I want to emphasize that I can act as an ally on dimensions of race. However, I'm not black, right? So I kind of, my goal here is to try to amplify the voices of people who are black rather than saying that I speak for black people because I clearly do not. So it's really, really important to, when you are acting as an ally to someone, really highlight their perspectives rather than, rather than impose your own. So let's talk about racism. I know that this can be a little bit uncomfortable, but we kind of have to talk about it in order to have the context we need to discuss things. Indigenous people have been exploited since, uh, since Europeans came to the, came to the Americas. Um, and then black people were brought over uh, by force in the Atlantic slave trade. And when slavery was outlawed, that didn't actually stop opportunity inequality. Sharecropping resulted in people being essentially an in indentured ser servitude, right? Um, there, were, there was apartheid going on inside of the United States all the way up through the 1960s. And even today, there are kind of all kinds of economic ramifications of having this kind of segregation, of redlining, of having black people be less likely to receive loans, to have black people have drastically less net worth on average than, than white Americans. Um, I read a shocking statistic saying that somewhere around uh, White Americans, on average, have about $50,000 to, uh, to $100,000 of household net worth. For black folks, that number is actually close to zero, right? It's either negative or like, you know, $10,000, right? Like, it's not, it's nowhere near the fifty dollars to $100,000 that white Americans have. So that's kind of a thing to think about, right? And there's also issues of, of violence. So, and this doesn't just impact indigenous and black people, right? The racism is very, very systemic. There's racism against initially Asian immigration up until the 1950s. And even to this day, Latinx people are demonized uh, in terms of immigration issues. So how does this impact technology? Well, similar to what I discussed earlier with the issues impacting women's access to tech jobs, Overall, the United States is 14% black and 17% Hispanic. Some overlap between those groups as well. Um, but only about 5% of people who are graduates of computer science programs in the United States are, are black. And only about 6% are, are Latinx. And even worse, at least for Google's publicly released statistics, somewhere between 1% and 2% of US tech Googlers are, are black and 3% are Hispanic, right? There's a huge gulf between the number of people who graduate from colleges and the number of people that are actually selected by tech companies that, that pay generous benefits and salaries. And this particularly impacts teams because of the fact that teams, software engineering teams, as you know, are like somewhere between five and 20 people. So it means that often people may not actually have ever worked on a team with a black person, right? And they lack the experiences of having talked to people who work with them who are black, right? And that impacts whose voices are present when you're talking about healthcare decisions, when you're talking about what impacts your technology will have upon communities that, that you serve. And what's especially interesting is kind of the intersection of these issues and other issues, <coughs> right? Intersectionality is a term that Kimberly Crenshaw, a black woman, coined, which says that when you have someone who belongs to more than one category, 
that it results in much more severe discrimination, much more severe marginalization than just belonging to one of those categories alone, especially in terms of violence against women of color and specifically against trans women of color. So I would be here for hours, and I don't have hours, um, if I were to talk about kind of all of these issues. But I think it's important to bear in mind that we have to be mindful of these issues in order to build a workplace that everyone feels comfortable working in. So let's talk about what some of those threats to inclusion might look like. So sometimes it's relatively obvious and might even make the headlines of the New York Times, right? When you have harassment, sexual harassment, when you have threats, when you have slurs, when people are making derogatory jokes and people laugh along, right? Those things are all things that really seriously damage the trust between employees. And ideally, that's something that HR departments are on top of. However, those are not necessarily, and fortunately, as we've discovered, sometimes HR departments are not, responsible, are not responsive to that, and that really sucks. But often, the issues that we're talking about, even if you address the kind of macroscopic issues, it becomes not obvious the ways in which people are suffering in silence. If you are the only person who is trans in your workplace, if you're the only person who's black in your workplace, you might feel like you have no one to relate to to talk about issues that you're encountering. You might feel like you kind of don't have advancement opportunities because often, too often, we wind up sponsoring people and giving opportunities to people who look like us. And it can help sometimes to reach across to people who are members of different communities. Uh, for instance, to people who are not working at your company but are a member of your same marginalized group in order to kind of get that peer support. And it is really helpful to have uh, employee resource groups. So I'm really glad that you have this Tech Talk series, for instance, because it kind of encourages people who are interested in these issues to come together and talk about them together. But I think the primary thing that we can do today is really focus on the issue of microaggressions. So microaggressions, uh, it's a term coined by Professor Pierce. And it describes kind of the smaller things that result in people feeling and welcome that are not necessarily individual things that you can point out and say, oh my goodness, like that was awful. But instead, they kind of collectively add up like a whole bunch of mosquito bites, right? One mosquito bite is maybe going to cause you to itch, but it's not a big deal, right? But when your body is covered in mosquito bite welts, that really, really sucks. Um, and it's really challenging to report these things because it often doesn't rise to the level of something that HR will do something about. And it often winds up being the case that people who work in environments with a lot of microaggressions try to grow thicker skin. And it's really not a wonderful situation because it causes you to kind of internally suffer and chafe. And also, it means that when someone else enters that environment, that you don't reach out your hand and support them. Instead, you tell them to toughen up, right? Like, that's not a very nice thing to do. I particularly liked the uh, Pixar film called Pearl. I think you should screen it at some point because it's a really awesome short film about kind of blending in and kind of growing that tougher skin versus actually building a more inclusive workplace. So let's talk about some concrete things. These are actual things that I have seen working in tech. And these are things that are not very inclusive that I think we can do a better job of. Again, real examples, not necessarily from Google, but things I have actually seen. Who wants to tell me what's, what's wrong with the first thing? Yeah, the word his, right? You, we shouldn't make assumptions about the gender of programmers, right? Or what about the second one? Anyone see a problem with that? See some heads nodding, right? It's anti-Semitic, right? It's making a Holocaust reference. It's saying, ha ha, that's funny. It's not actually that funny, right? We can fix it. When the programmer calls the, calls the API, their account will be billed. Let's restart all the broken servers, right? Easy enough. OK, how about the, these two? These are a little bit more subtle. Or maybe not, depending upon your experiences. What's wrong with the, what's wrong with the first of these two new lines? It's yeah, it's ableist, right? Crippled should not be used as an insult, right? Like, that's, that's a slur. What about the second one? Ageist. Yeah, it's ageist, right? We shouldn't make assumptions about how able to use technology someone is based off of their age. So we can fix these, right? And say the product is weakened because of DRM. Or it's so simple anyone can use it, regardless of their technical ability. How about these ones? What do people think? Assuming gender binary? Yeah, the first one assumes a gender binary and specifically makes assumptions about 
it's an anatomical reference that makes assumptions about, about people's genders and anatomy, right? Like that's probably not okay. What about the second one? It's yeah, it's heteronormative, right? It assumes that, that, that men always marry women, right? So we can fix these again, right? We can talk specifically and say this one's a plug, this one's a socket, right? And not make, not make allusions to, to male and female. And we can talk about situations that are not as kind of charged, right? We can talk about situations that involve like inter matching interns and hosts. This one, unfortunately, I've seen all over the place in open source projects, in projects within Google. It happens all the time, and we can really do a lot better, right? We don't have to use master-slave terminology, and in fact, it winds up being a lot clearer what the relationship is. For instance, the primary propagates rights to the replica, or the coordinator assigns work to the workers, right? Like, those are, those are two very different terms and they more clearly communicate what's going on inside of our systems. Let's talk about these last two. What do people think? Right, the first one is fat phobic. And the second one demeans the skills that our colleagues have, right? That's not okay. So we can fix these, right? And it also is much more specific, right? Are binaries link in and use libraries, right? Or let's stop using technical <laughs> jargon, right? It's our fault if we're not communicating well enough, right? It's not because our colleagues aren't smart, right? And I think that that's really important to highlight. So these are things that I have actually seen in my career, and I think that we can do better at. And I'm encouraging you, you know, not to beat yourself up about it, but instead to say, you know what? If you catch yourself doing this, just correct yourself, right? Correct yourself, apologize, and then set a better example for other people. So if you don't address these issues, right, this results in people becoming stressed, becoming depressed, taking sick leave, quitting your company and telling, your co and telling people not to apply and work there, or even leaving the entire industry. And that's not okay. And this is not a pipeline problem, right? You can't hire your way out of a toxic culture. You have to fix your culture first. In my friend Erica Joy Baker's words, right, like you cannot just keep shoving people in and hiring all these people and hiring and hiring and that's going to fix it if they all wind up leaving. So in conclusion, you know, you can't be perfect all the time, but I think one lesson they've learned from being a site reliability engineer is that we have to think about how do we create structural change, right? And one way of structural change is adding safeguards, right? Have someone else review your talks for sensitivity before you give them. Or have a blameless post-mortem process, right? Not if someone's being a malicious bigot, but instead of like, if you catch yourself making a mistake, figure out how can I feel safe saying, oops, I made a mistake, I'm going to fix it. Here's what I'm doing in order to make sure it doesn't happen again. So don't accept the status quo. We can do a lot better. And as a very famous Australian general uh, has said, the standard you walk past is the standard that you accept. So, Think about who your peers might be, even if it's not necessarily visible, and think about your users, and think about how you can make them feel included. That is kind of the first half of the talk, talking a little bit about how we work more effectively together.